أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب القلوبنا وشافع أنفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وأهل أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين Dear viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam and indeed anyone who's viewing the show who happens to be from a non-Muslim audience indeed I greet you in the Islamic greeting of peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and I welcome you back to this episode of your show The Laws of Zahra alayhi salam Of course, those viewers who may have tuned in to the first two episodes would be familiar with the fact we had not entered quite into the depth of the discussion. The discussion, of course, being the laws of Sayyida Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, which have been extracted in particular works by the great Marja Dini, Ayatollah al ufma Al-Imam Muhammad al husseini Al-Shirazi, Rahmatullah alayhi. And we mentioned that it was necessary for us prior to engaging into the real substance of the discussion, namely mentioning the laws which have been extracted by the great scholar who has of course passed away, Imam Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi. Prior to engaging with that, we wish to give certain necessary preliminary discussions which are of course of the utmost importance in understanding the topic at hand. From amongst the discussions which we felt was necessary to basically give an introduction to, we felt it was necessary, number one, to introduce the great personality of Imam Muhammad Shirazi, which was done in episode one. And thereafter, in episode two, we went on to discuss some of the reasons for why it is indeed necessary to enter into such historical discussions, despite the fact that some people find them to be sensitive topics. Until now, we have not had a chance to engage with the discussion as to who the great lady of all the people of history, namely Sayyidah Fatima Zahra, was and is. The viewers who are, of course, Shia, will be more than familiar with the great personality, the mother of the successors of the Holy Prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, of course, the exception of Amir al-Mu'mineen, who was her husband. May the peace and blessings be upon them all. However, some of our viewers who are tuning in from a non-Muslim audience may not indeed be familiar with the great personality of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, and indeed some viewers may not have had the opportunity to read nor learn as much about this great woman as they would have pleased to, or they would have liked to. to. So we enter into the discussion as to who is Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. But before I do that, I would like to, of course, continue upon the discussion or the train of thought which we placed ourselves on in the last episode of the show. We were discussing the need of such a work and why this work would be important to the Muslim Ummah and indeed to the world at large today. Indeed, it is a question which many may ask, for indeed, some people may be wondering why would we benefit from merely another work which is extracting fiqhi laws. Some people wish to benefit from things other than fiqh, because one of the most important things in a Muslim's life is jurisprudence, to know the laws of Islam, and therefore many people may already be acquainted with such laws. The answer to such a question is of course that in order to clarify the position of Islam today in the world, the position of the original Muhammadan Islam, and when I say Muhammadan, I do not mean Muhammadan in the naive way which was originally intended by some of the Orientalists when they dismissed Muslims by calling them Muhammadans, namely those who follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Rather, we mean the original Al-Islam al muhammadiyah the original Islam as was manifested and practiced and taught that Islam which emanated from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Indeed, as I mentioned yesterday, and in order to place more emphasis onto the topic, we find ourselves living in a world in which 
many people are claiming to speak in the name of Islam. Some of them intrinsically good people. Some of them horrendously evil people. And we pray that we are not placed from amongst those who are horrendously evil. Yet nonetheless, we find that not only do we have those Muslims who out, out there who lack in terms of behavior and will be the first to admit that, look, I'm not a good person, but that is in, contradict in contradiction and in stark contrast to the, what the religion of Islam has asked of me. But more importantly, we have also those people who do horrendous acts, filthy acts, filthy crimes, disgusting crimes in the name of religion of Islam and claim that they can find these actions within the seerah and practices of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa In the previous episode, we referred to this problem as the real problem of interpretation. The problem of interpretation is an important one, for indeed it is one which confuses many non-Muslims. We have many non-Muslims out there who are saying that, look, Yes, I know you're a good Muslim. I've spoken to you. You seem to, be like, you seem to be a nice guy. You seem to be a nice woman. However, I find that you might not be speaking in the true name of Islam. And why might they say this? They might say, look, I got hold of a biography of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa And I find that Group X, for example, those who might be committing barbaric acts in the name of Islam, happen to be more in line with that particular biography of the Holy Prophet. So we have a problem of sources and more importantly, a problem of interpretation. This problem of interpretation brought us back to why we must refer to Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And indeed, it is a crucial topic. It's a topic which we find the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi alluded to and is at the very crux of a different of the issue which differentiates us Shia from the rest of the Muslim world. What is that issue? The issue is of course the issue of wilaya, the issue of dynamic leadership from where we take the perfectly inspired religion of Islam. For we find the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa according to both Muslim sects, according to the Shia in addition to the non-Shia, was known to have said there is amongst you, O oh my companions, one who fights the people upon the issue of interpretation, just as I fought the people on the issue of revelation. Namely, he would fight the people on the issue of ta'wil, just as I fought them on the issue of tanzil. Now, what did, what did the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi mean by this? Of course, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was referring to the issue that in his lifetime he was fought by people who were open disbelievers in the book of Allah Azza people who declared war upon him because he was the prophet of Allah, people who openly rejected the revelation of Allah and openly lied, slandered and worked towards his killing just because he was the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and was calling people to monotheism and calling them to a better way of life. Yet we find that by the death of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, by the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, many of these people had already converted to the religion of Islam. Now there is a legitimate question amongst the historians, be they Sunni or Shia, as to whether or not all the people who converted to the religion of Islam outwardly were legitimate converts. Did they legitimately convert because they believed or did they maybe have some other kind of worldly intentions which gave them a motive or desire to outwardly convert in order to attain that goal? According to the Quran, the Quran is very clear. There is a whole surah, a whole chapter named al munafiqun namely the hypocrites. And we find that the definition of a hypocrite is one who outwardly displays Islam, yet inwardly has disbelief. The very fact that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa exposed some of these hypocrites and gave the ability for other people from amongst his companions, such as Huvayfa, the ability to determine between a munafiq and a real mu'min 
shows that there were a series of individuals who were claiming outwardly to be Muslim, yet were indeed disbelievers inside. Now, of course, this falls back to the issue of interpretation, because someone who has now emerged into the religion of Islam is in a position from within inside the religion to attempt to corrupt that religion, to attempt to give his own motives under the guise of being religious and attempt to fabricate, attempt to distort the original prophetic message. So we find when the Holy Prophet said that there would be one from amongst his companions who would fight for people upon interpretation just as he fought them over revelation, several companions come forward. I'm narrating what is found in the books of the Ahl Sunnah and these are not kind of words from my own pocket nor are these interpretations for myself. It is narrated that Abu Bakr comes forward and asks, is it I, O Rasulullah? It is narrated that Omar comes forward and asks, is it I, O Rasulullah? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa responds to both of them by telling them that it is neither of you. The people thereafter ask, who is it, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa And he responds, it is, it is the one who is repairing the sandal, the one who is repairing my slipper. Of course, they all turn to the one repairing his slipper, and this happens to be Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. So we find that the Holy Prophet had already alluded to the fact that there would be a party from amongst the believers who we could turn to. We believe, of course, that the Prophets already openly declared who his successor would be prior to his passing away, but other than that, he had already provided us with numerous clues as to how to prevent this religion from being distorted, from being claimed by people who have nothing to do with this religion, claimed by people who wish to distort and pervert the religion of Islam by doing filthy things in its name. On the basis of this, we find that the true interpretation of Islam can be found with none other than the Ahlul Bayt. As the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa said on his farewell pilgrimage, I leave behind two weighty things, the Book of Allah and my Ahlul Bayt, my Itra. And these two things shall never separate until they reach me at the lake font in the hereafter. Based upon this, we can derive several important key messages. Of course, Bringing this all back to the point we find Sayyidah Fatimah al-Zahra is of the Ahlul Bayt. But more importantly, we find that the Ahlul Bayt and the Quran can never be separated. If we submit to this, which all the Muslims do due to the widespread nature of this tradition, we will see the conclusions of such a narration when we return back to the show after the break, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum. Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Shirazi was the religious authority merge to millions of Shia Muslim around the globe. A charismatic leader who is known for his high moral values, modesty and spirituality. He is a mentor and source of aspiration to the millions and the means of access to authentic knowledge and teachings of Islam. He has made extensive contributions in fields of learning ranging from jurisprudence and theology to politics, economics, law and sociology. Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi was born in the holy city of Najaf, Iraq in 1374 after Hijra, 1927 AD. He belongs to a distinguished family deeply rooted in Islamic science, literature and virtue. His followers are found in many countries in the global. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi was distinguished for his intellectual ability and holistic vision. He was recognized for his clear ideas and realistic solutions to issues of concern to mankind. He has written various specialized studies that are concerned to be among the most important references in the Islamic sciences of beliefs and doctrine, ethics, politics, economics, sociology, law, human rights, etc. He has enriched the world with his staggering contributions of some 1300 books, treaties, and studies on various branches of learning. His works range from simple introductory books for the young generations to literary and scientific masterpieces. Deeply rooted in the Holy Quran and the teachings of the Prophet of Islam, 
His visions and theories covers areas as politics, economics, government, management, sociology, theology, philosophy, history, and Islamic law. His work on Islamic jurisprudence, for example, contributes 150 volumes which run into more than 55,000 pages. Through his original thoughts and ideas, he has championed the causes of issues such as the family, human rights, freedom of expression, political pluralism, non-violence, and shura or consultative system of leadership. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi believes in the fundamental and elementary nature of freedom in mankind. He calls for freedom of expressions, political plurality, debate and discussion, tolerance and forgiveness. He strongly believes in the consultative system of leadership and calls for the establishment of the leadership council of religious authorities. He calls for the establishment of the universal Islamic government to encompass all the Muslim countries. Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, welcome back to the show. Thank you for enduring with us during that, small, that short break. Returning back to the topic which we were originally upon prior to the short break, we were discussing the tradition of thakalain, the two weighty objects or the two necessary objects. A thakal is described as that which one takes on a journey because it is necessary for him to suffice or subsist. And so we find that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, and the Quran or those things which were left behind by the Holy Prophet to all Muslims. And all Muslims are agreed upon this fact. The very fact that the Holy Prophet had said that they do not separate leads us to the understanding that these two objects share certain aspects in common. If we submit that the Quran is the infallible word of Allah Azzawajal, that is not corruptible, then likewise we submit that the Ahlul Bayt are infallible and uncorruptible. If we submit that the Quran has in it timeless guidance for all of mankind, we likewise submit that the Ahlul Bayt contain within them timeless guidance for all of mankind. If we submit that the Quran does not have any falsehood within it, we likewise submit that the Ahlul Bayt have no falsehood within them, nor do they utter falsehoods. So we find that the Ahlul Bayt have been left behind for us as this infallible means of determining truth. Of course, there is a discussion in regards to who the Ahlul Bayt are. We will enter that discussion prior to discussing some of the laws from, from Az-Zahra alayhi salam. However, that's not the discussion for today. Allow us to stick to the personality of Fatima al Zahra. We've discussed already the personality of her husband according to that one narration and how we can derive infallibility from him in that regard. Now let us come to the issue of who is Fatima al Zahra. Who is this great daughter of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? I of course do not wish to take the time of the Muslims or indeed the non-Muslim guests who may be tuning into the show by giving particular details in regards to when Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra was born, in which year she died, in which city she lived, for such details are not of the utmost importance. When I give you this introduction to Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, and might I add, I feel humbled and ashamed to have to do so because I'm not worthy of speaking of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. I'm not someone who should be presenting to you these great merits of this great daughter of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But rather, the constrictions placed upon me due to the nature of the show necessitate that I give this short introduction and I do so as someone unworthy to even call myself a follower or lover of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra. According to a rawaya from the sixth holy Imam, Imam Jafar ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, who all Muslims recognize as the peak of knowledge and the peak of the Islamic sciences, and the essentially we could call him a walking university has stated in a narration about Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, Fatima has nine names with Allah Azza wa They are Fatima, that's one, As-Siddiqah, Al-Mubarakah, 
And of course, the Siddiqa means the righteous or the truthful. Al Mubaraka, meaning the blessed. Al Tahira, meaning the pure. Al Zakiya, the unblemished. Al Raviya, the one content with Allah's pleasure. Al Marviya, the one pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. Al Muhaddatha, the one spoken to by the angels. And the Zaha, and Al Zahira, namely the luminous. Now, of course, when we say that she was spoken to by the angels, does this make Fatima to Zahra a prophet, as some people would like to accuse us, Vishi, of believing? When we come to this issue of Mus'haf Fatima, the scrolls of Fatima, we do not believe this is the Quran or even an alternative to the Quran. We believe this was a special set of scrolls gifted to Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra, alayhi salam, and we will discuss that in further detail. But does the very fact that we say she was a muhaditha, someone who spoke to the angels, or someone who the angels spoke to, make her somehow a prophetess? Or likewise, does it place the Shia out with the fold of Islam for believing in such? Absolutely not. We find that when we refer back to the Holy Quran, numerous women have been spoken to by angels, be they Maryam, the mother of Isa, alayhi salam, or be they the mother of Musa, who is not even recorded to be anything particularly special according to the ranks of some people. Because of course some people might come forward and say that Maryam is considered a prophet by certain people. Yes, the Vahiri school, led by Ibn Hazm in his time, believed Maryam was a prophet, but most of the Sunni Muslims do not. So the very fact that you have Maryam being spoken to by the angels, allows the fact that other women would be spoken to by angels. And if this can be achieved by a high priestess from Bani Israel, from the lineage of Harun, who was a prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal, then it can naturally be attained by the daughter of the greatest of creation, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Likewise, we come to one of the most crucial discussions in regards to who is Sayyidah Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. We come to the discussion as to what has been said about her according to both schools of Islam. What is agreed upon by the Muslims in regards to the nature of Sayyidah Fatima Zahra and what distinctly highlights her above the rest of the women of all worlds. We find one of the narrations mentioned by the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and agreed upon by both Sunni and Shia is the fact that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had uttered the words Fatima babbatun minni namely Fatima is a part of me and he goes on to say whoever offends her whoever upsets her whoever angers her whoever hurts her man a'vaha has hurt me that is to say, whoever offends, whoever upsets the Holy Prophet's daughter, Sayyidah Fatima Zahra, has gone on to offend and upset the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Now, do we believe that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa was a man who was wise? Do we believe that he had a control over his words and was very precise in his wording? Absolutely. No Muslim in the world would argue that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa would teach things ambiguously to his Ummah, teach things ambiguously to his followers. For indeed, if the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa were to do this, we would find that the Muslims would be in much disunity, chaos, and naturally and justifiably on the Day of Judgment, we would have a hujja against Allah Azza wa Jal, for choosing such a person who was unclear in the messages he gave to us. Now, of course, this is not only putting a blemish onto Rasulullah, it's putting a blemish onto Allah Azza wa Jal. And such a belief is a belief which would lead to only disbelief. So when we say that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa gave an unconditional promise and statement that Fatima Zahra is a part of him Whoever angers her has, ever, has also angered him. He did not say whoever angers her in worldly matters or in religious matters. He did not say whoever angers her in 
the issue of X or Y. Rather, he gave a general statement, whoever angers Fatima has angered me. On the basis of this, we find that the Muslims can come to the conclusion of this narration alone, that Sayyidah Fatima salam, is infallible. Her words are words of truth and she does not speak falsehood. Why? For indeed, if she were not infallible, this would open up the, rag- the rational dilemma of how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi could share in the anger of someone who mistakenly got angry with someone. Namely, she got, if, if she were able to get angry with someone on the issue of a mistake, of a misunderstanding, of something that was not an issue of haqq and batil, truth and falsehood, then how could the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi share in this anger with her? How could he say that I am angry at that which angers her? To perpetuate the issue, we find that unfortunately, unfortunately, there was a mission in history itself to dissolve the rights of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam and usurp their merits namely to give their merits to other people, to strip them of their merits, and to put blemishes upon them. And it is with a great unfortunate, great misfortune, that we find this tradition has been preserved. How? When we refer back to Bukhari's so-called As-Sahih, we find that this tradition is preserved in a fabricated tradition in which Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is said to be the one who angers Fatima. It is said that he wished to propose to the daughter of Abi Jahal, namely one of the worst opponents of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And when he wished to do so, this upset Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. As a result, the Prophet apparently got angry with Amir al-Mu'mineen and said these words. Of course, we believe this is one of the most disgusting and abominable fabrications in history. And indeed, it is refuted by the fact that Amir al-Mu'mineen salam, according to numerous transmitted proofs, is infallible. But what this shows, and this narration, by the way, has also made its way into the books of our very own Shia scholars. And the scholars need to ask the reason why. Why? Is it that such narrations made their way into the books of history? Could it be, as some of my teachers in the seminary have put forward, that it was only through denigrating Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam that the truth of Ail of Fatima al-Zahra could actually be preserved? Namely, if people saw it was only a merit of the Ahlul Bayt, and it did not involve denigration of someone like Amir al-Mu'mineen or one of the other Ahlul Bayt, then they would not have transmitted this tradition. And therefore we find this was one of the ways that this transmission was able to be preserved. We take the agreed upon text, namely that Fatima is part of the Holy Prophet. Whoever angers her has angered the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa And we reject the disgusting fabrications and demeaning of the Ahlul Bayt which have been attached to this tradition. But that one tradition that she is part of the Holy Prophet is an agreed upon one. And so we, it, we are talking about that text. And inshallah ta'ala, we will discuss this text further within the next halaqa or the next episode of this program. Thank you all for joining me and I pray that you do not forget me in your du'as. Hava wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala bayti at-tayyibin at-tahirin.